Uh, now it's recording, so you know everybody. Molly writes the song, uh, and she attends directly from the US in North Carolina. Molly's the CEO and president of American Swedish Institute in Minneapolis. And we also have Maria Klint, and she's the service designer at Antrop, a Swedish design agency that, that has been um, uh, working with service design, uh, for example, uh, with the SIDAS AI lab. And SIDA, that's Sweden's aid authority. And as usual, we will also meet Jonas Olsson, CEO at Svid, and Mats Wiedbom, CEO at Svensk Forum. And you can write questions in the chat function. Uh, Caroline Lundén Velden at Svid will uh, take care of your questions and you can either write in Swedish or in English. My name is Helena Godotte Karlberg and I'm the board member of the Swedish Design Society. And we have been arranging design talks together with the Svensk Forum at Svid, the Swedish Industrial Design Foundation for about two years now. And today's design talks is the first in a three part series on design and the future. And today we focus on AI and the 6th of December design and the climate. And the 8th of February next year, we focus on the hand. And of course you are more than welcome to attend the other two as well. But today it's focused on AI and our first speaker, she's a designer leader, historian, and a writer. And among other things, she writes about the past, the present, and the future of AI design and architecture. She's an associated professor at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. She holds a PhD in architecture from Princeton University in New Jersey, and a master in environmental design from the Yale School of Architecture in New Haven, Connecticut. She has been living in a number of uh, numbers of places all over the world, for example, in India, Denmark, and Germany. And she has her roots in Sweden, actually in Jämtland, Östersund. And she has also been working at the university in Umeå for a while. Please welcome Molly Wright Stenson directly from the US. <laughs> Good morning, I should say. Good morning, I should Good say. Good morning, yes. And very nice to see some familiar faces here, including Bruce Karstadt, who is um, the former president and CEO of the American Swedish Institute. It is even earlier in Minnesota than it is here in um, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Wow. Um, You're yeah. very welcome. Yeah. And since July, you've been the CEO and the new president of the American Swedish Institute. That's right. Uh, in Minneapolis. That's correct. And that's, and that's your hometown. I am back home. I am back in my hometown. This is true. Um, thank you. So how does it feel to be home again? It's wonderful. It is It is truly wonderful to be home. Um, the American Swedish Institute is a place that I've loved since I was a little girl. And my family has come to more recently over the years. And it is a really amazing opportunity to be um, leading this 94-year-old cultural institution and at the same time to be thinking about things like generative AI. And I'll try to bridge these two things in, in my talk. Yeah, so please begin. Thank you. So my talk is called What It Really Means to Be Generative. Um, I mentioned, we were just talking about the American Swedish Institute. It was um, founded in 1929 and we consist of an, a, historic mansion that was built in 1908. On the right hand side, you see a little bit of what we look like at Christmas. It's a very beautiful time. We are decorated right now for the holidays. This is what we look like inside. That's our great hall on the left. You see a himli hanging from a Finnish Sami artist. I'll talk more about her work in a minute. And this is our music room right here um, on the first floor of the mansion. So you may be wondering, some things like what about why generative AI and a cultural institution? And I think that this has something to do with the lenses with how we interpret the world. A lot of times when we look at the question of AI, if we, I typed this into Google yesterday, AI is the new and all sorts of things come into the picture. AI is the new electricity. AI is the new oil. AI is the new future or the new crypto. 
And the fact is that AI isn't new really at all, even though everybody wants to believe that it is. In the United States, AI could get social security. It could retire. It is so old. We have been using the term artificial intelligence since 1955. This is from the founding of the Dartmouth Conference, which is when the research agenda for artificial intelligence was set out in 1955 by some of the people you see in this picture. In 1950, Alan Turing, who you might know about through the idea of the imitation game or the Turing test, said, I propose to consider the question, can a machine think? He had the idea of a computer being a computer mind being like a blank book that you could fill with words or a child's mind, that it's related to learning. And this has always been a key idea about artificial intelligence. But again, this is 1950 that this idea is coming from. And even the impact of AI in architecture was felt as early as 1964. Um, I won't go into much detail here, but there was a really great conference called Architecture and the Computer that had a statement read by Walter Gropius right before he died, and by Marvin Minsky, who was a participant, and by Christopher Alexander. Marvin Minsky is one of the foremost AI leaders in the world, passed away a few years ago. Christopher Alexander is the architect. I'll speak about him again in a minute. The point being that everybody has long been afraid of the impact of computation and AI on the creative disciplines. And you can see this here. Here's an article from August in The Guardian. It's already way beyond what humans can do. Will AI wipe out architects? And it's going to have an impact on the discipline and it will change some jobs, but I don't think architects are going to totally go away. When I put together this talk, I thought I'd ask AI what it might think I should call the talk. And what I see here in all of these titles it came up with is that AI believes that it is without history. And unveiling the timeless power of generative AI or unveiling its enduring evolution. Um, I thought these were interesting enough to share with you. You will see I didn't choose them to name my talk. AI believes it is new because it is trained on data that believes it is new, but it isn't new at all. And neither is generative AI. And even though these, these are recent news headlines from the New York Times and they look noisy and they look bombastic and big, questions like are AI and democracy compatible? Generative AI is here, who should control it? Will it transform the economy and so on? I want to expand how we think about what generative means. I think it's useful for us as designers and as architects and for people in design studies and culture. Although the US government de defines AI as basically an algorithmic model, al algorithmic model based on some kind of input data to produce some kind of synthesized synthetic content derived from that data. So you put in text and you get images, or you put in video and you get a fake video. Um, this is this is how the, the government defines generative AI as something to look at in terms of bias and human harm. But if we look at the dictionary definition of AI, we see something related to the generation of offspring, something that procreates, something that's creative and causative. And this definition comes from one of the first dictionaries to be uh, in Latin and then translated into English in the 14th century. And when I ask Google's AI what generative means, it gives up. It gives me these other ideas, like caring for subsequent generations, nurturing and guiding young people, and leaving a mark on the world, making it a better place. A little bit different than these technical definitions. So if we expand our, our frame a little bit, then generative AI could start dealing with the idea of being nurturing and improving the world and not just a technical concept. So this is where I'm quoting somebody who is on this call. Um, and it's the question of what sort of history can be made from this outlook. In 2020, I had the honor and the pleasure of being on Maria Joran's daughter's um, dissertation 
committee as her opponent. And she wrote a dissertation called Transitional Design Histories that had a profound impact on me and how I see the role of making history. And I will give you the, the whole dissertation. If you have not read it, you should. Um, but there are a couple of things there that, that really stand out to me. And that's that the things we use to think with influence the things we do and the things we make whether the thing is a material object, a process, or a concept. I think this is something that a lot of us as designers think about. But she also asks the question, what sort of history can be made from this outlook in design? And she considers this to be a prototyping process, that we try it and we try it again and we try it again from this angle and this angle. Where you start from determines the kind of future that you can have. So what kind of history can, gen can we generate from a different angle. I'm the author of a book called Architectural Intelligence, How Designers and Architects Created the Digital Landscape. And the major chapters in the book center on four architects, Cedric Price, who's got the sunglasses on, Christopher Alexander, Richard Solberman, and Nicholas Negroponte with the Architecture Machine Group. All very important figures, but all white male heroes. Um, I have started to question lately what kind of history can be made from a different outlook. So while I won't go into detail here, the Architecture Machine Group became the MIT Media Lab. And these are some of the early um, AI interfaces and digital interfaces that that group did. You'll see things that look a lot like chatbots, iPads, and Google Maps. If I had started from a different perspective at uh, the Architecture Machine Group, I might have fo followed the work of Rebecca Allen, who was working on music and music videos with Kraftwerk, the German band. Um, and this is from Music Nonstop. I know that there are enough techno fans in the house to, uh, to recognize these. These wireframes and these um, robot cyborgs took two years for her to create. She still works with Kraftwerk. If I had started from that angle, we might have a history of AI that incorporated generative music and electronic music at its core. Or if I had looked differently, like Charlton McElwain does, I might have understood the racial biases at MIT in the 1960s, where one half of 1% of the student body was black. One half of 1%. If I had started instead as Charlton McElwain, the author of Black Software does, at Clemson University in the American South, following Black African-American computer scientists, I would have had a very different perspective on what generative AI would mean today and who would be in that picture. If I'd started my work from the perspective of Dr. Jamika Burge, who is the head of research and insights for Capital One Bank, um, and a computer science scholar um, who got her PhD at Virginia Tech, and her work with Black Computer, which is a mentoring and um, development organization for Black women in tech, I would have a very different perspective on what kind of history could be made from that perspective. So what kinds of histories could be generated from that outlook? I mentioned Christopher Alexander, and he um, is well known for the work he did with a pattern language and the Center for Environmental, Environmental Structure. We don't have a history of AI in architecture or software design without Christopher Alexander's work in the 1970s. And I realize that even as I'm talking about all of the authors on the book, A Pattern Language, I keep only mentioning his name. The idea of patterns is so central to how we design and how we work in digital media. This is this is an example of a pattern right here. Um, that it's it's fundamental to object oriented programming languages and a couple of things I'll share in a moment. But you'll see right next to Christopher Alexander's name is Sarah Ishikawa, who is an emerit professor at UC Berkeley. She's his right hand. She did all of this work with Christopher Alexander. What would a history look like that begins? from that perspective of generative AI. Generative AI had, or excuse me, patterns had a big influence on agile software development. So anyone who's using agile processes or scrums in your work are using, you are using Christopher Alexander's ideas. And if you've ever used a wiki in your life, the wiki software, the wiki format is coming from um, a generative software and patterns perspective. 
So what kinds of history could be generated from this outlook? I find myself looking at a book I published in 2017 and asking who and what is left out by the starting points that we choose. And it's a daunting moment. It's a hard thing to realize of how I could have done this differently and what, what choices um, I made and the impact that could have had. So let me suggest a few things here. In Maria's work, she's referring often to the idea of the futures cone. Where we start is like a flashlight. And if we cast it outward, in the middle of that flashlight is the bright light of what is probable. But as it goes outward, 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 and we see its shadow on the wall, there's a bigger, there's a bigger range of possibilities. And five years ago, we might all have thought it was a strange possibility that a pandemic could shut down the world. Um, but sure enough, the kind of preposterous things happened, or that a racial reckoning could happen worldwide that starts in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. about a mile from the American Swedish Institute. Changing the stories we tell about what the present is and where it comes from can support changing how and on what we choose to take action, Maria writes. This is why there needs to be a plurality of perspectives, stories, and understandings that come together in negotiating what design could actually be possible now and not only in the future. Histories are speculative, so are futures. Futures are speculative, so are histories. So if we looked at a plurality of perspectives, stories, and understandings, I'll give you a couple of starting points. We could look at the work of the indig Indigenous AI Working Group, the Indigenous Protocol and Artificial Intelligence Working Group. I would suggest taking a look at what they're doing around ethics, bias, intelligences, relations, and protocols. They also are running a six-year research project in three countries on two continents about abundant intelligences funded by major research organizations. I would suggest looking at the work of Dr. Vernell Noel. She is an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon in the School of Architecture. She's from Trinidad and she looks at the process of wire bending, which is how carnival shapes and floats are made during the carnival season there. She's developed a Rhino plugin and a 3D modeling language, a computational language based on the physical relations and milieu of interactions. Or the work of an artist that we are working with and have been really lucky to know at ASI, Tia Kea Bunfeng, who recently learned in 2021 that she has Sami lineage. She'd grown up thinking she was Finnish. Her work, are a de her work is a decolonizing process where she's working with pencil on board with thread. And so she considers these to be abstract um, tapestries. She calls this thinking circularly and not linearly. And she's also she also has Himli, which are the Finnish um, the Finnish kind of sculptural uh, Christmas ornaments hanging from um, our ceiling in our artist's studio at ASI. And this is another process that she's she has studied. So generative AI could include intelligences, ethics, relations, handcraft, situatedness, and protocols. As Shelby Doyle, who is a feminist technology architecture professor says, we are all part of a lineage or dozens of lineages. How can we better recognize the enormous collective knowledge and labor of architecture as a way to keep challenging ideas of solo authorship? She thinks that maybe AI might make us a little less lonely working together, that maybe we could, instead of feeling challenged, maybe we could use this as a way to open up the dialogue and ask important questions about the data that goes into the work that we're using. So then generative, generative AI becomes something in, different if we look at it from this perspective in these histories, nurturing and caring for future generations, mutually beneficial relationships, and improving the world. So I'd like to take the time and ask us all to ask what it really means to be generative. Look at history, presents, and futures that are generative in the truest definition. And I'm in the unlikely but very beautiful position of being able to do this from a historical, from a historical um, institution, an important place in Minneapolis to frame some of these questions and make connections to Sweden. So I'll stop there and say thank you.
Thank you very much, Molly. And this was very, very interesting. I thought AI was a little bit different before we did this design talk, and I'm not sure I'm, <laughs> I have a clearer picture now, but it's, uh, it's much wider. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting that you include the history, the present and the future. Um, but you also talk about ethics. So, and I know you, you, you work a lot with eth ethics. So what do you think about AI and ethics? Well, I think that AI, we, we need ethical standpoints. I'm a little bit critical of how some tech companies and some, some governments have gone after it. But what I might say for designers and for architects, we are the people who design where ethics meet where everybody lives. So that question of ethics is one that falls upon us as, as designers. And we find ourselves in the room making decisions about what will happen with, um, with technology that impacts everyday people. So I, I would encourage people here on this call, and I figure if people are here, they're interested in questions about computation and AI and technology to consider the impact of users and to understand how we are in the position of translating those experiences. And as you said in the beginning, you are a new CEO and president at the American Swedish Institute in Minneapolis, a place I actually been to once a long time ago <laughs> when I graduated from high school. It was interesting then, and I guess it's even more interesting today. And Bruce Karstadt is actually with us today. He is. That's he so is. nice. Yeah. So I have a question both for you and for Bruce, but how, how are you going to use AI at this institute? it's almost 100 years old. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's one of these questions where we are all using AI and advanced computation every day in things we're doing. It's in our email, it's in our servers, it's in my mobile phone. Um, so it's a part of what we do. But what I would also say is that I... At ASI, we are centered on migration, identity, and belonging. And these questions about identity and belonging and how a beloved cultural institution frames that for people and makes it a place where people come together is something that I want to take to how we talk about AI. So I want to believe that there's a way to have these big conversations from the perspective of an old institution. Yeah. And for almost like 200 years ago, a lot of Swedish people emigrated to Minneapolis, St. Paul, it's in Minnesota. <laughs> uh, today, they might not immigrate uh, in that quite a bunch of people, but you still have a lot of immigrants in you Minneapolis. Do. Can you say something about that? Yes. Um, Minneapolis is very much a city of immigrants. So we have a large Somali population. And in fact, we have Somali Swedes who um, who live in Minneapolis as well. We have, um, back in the late 70s, early 80s, many people who are Hmong, which is, um, I can spell this so that you can see it. Um, many Hmong people emigrated to the Twin Cities and um, they came from Vietnam and um, Laos. They're originally from, ethnically from China. And recently, over the last 30 years, there's been a growing population coming from Mexico and Latin America. So the Twin Cities that I left in 1990 is a lot different than the Twin Cities that I moved back to. Um, that This is a, a wonderful thing. And I think one of the, the opportunities that we have is an institution that was founded by immigrants. Um, Svan Turnblad founded the American Swedish Institute um, as a Swedish immigrant and newspaper, Swedish American newspaper publisher. So we have the same kind of frame there. And that's one of the lenses that we bring a Swedish lens on um, and connections on um, migration identity and belonging. Great, that's so interesting to hear. And Bruce Karstad, you're, you are the old CEO at the American Swedish Institute and you've been there for almost three decades, I think. So. Uh, do you have any reflections of what you heard Molly was talking about, the new CEO? Goodness, um, <laughs> I, it's so early in the morning, and uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, yes, yeah, so I am the old CEO. Maybe I should um, 
I suppose, do this. But um, uh, no, I really appreciated Molly's perspective and particularly the introduction of Tia uh, and her work to, uh, to the conversation, uh, because certainly in our exhibitions and public programs, we've, we've engaged to a certain extent uh, uh, in, in forest design and generative ideas uh, that we hope have an impact upon, upon community. Uh, uh, and, and more broadly intersecting with other communities that uh, are uh, among, uh, that are uh, uh, migration uh, centric as, as, as well. Uh, and that's been a new development over the last 90 years. We were much more inwardly focused and now much more broadly focused. Yeah, I guess we have a lot to learn from you uh, in Sweden. So I, I hope we can have some more contact after this design talk. So thank you very much, Molly. I, I, don't, I can't see we have any questions in the chat. Caroline, am I right? Do we have any questions? No, you're or perfect. Wait later? You're perfectly right. We don't have any questions. Um, I guess they will come a, little, a bit later. Okay. So we go on to the next speaker. She is a service designer in the design agency Anthrop. And Anthrop works with customer-driven business development and uses design mythology to create services, behaviors, and change. And Maria works with circular business development and has, during the past four years, worked on building up and running SIDA's innovation lab in, for example, Bangladesh, and also in some African countries. And uh, Maria, she actually ac actually recently moved to Molly's roots in Jämtland, not Östersund, but a little bit nor north of Östersund in Åre. <laughs> so welcome, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get So this. you have some connections there in yeah. Jämtland. So uh, <laughs> how do you like Åre? <laughs> beautiful it's white and snowy and ice cold at the moment it's beautiful yeah and i guess the ski slopes opens on friday right yes they do <laughs> i know what i'm doing then <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great and actually we have a lot of snow where i'm at, at as well i'm in lulio so a little bit of northern is uh, um, in the northern part of Sweden as well. So Maria, you will give uh, some concrete examples of how you and Anthrop use AI as a tool in the design process. So yeah. please, the stage is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so um, artificial intelligence and design. Uh, I feel very humble uh, to be asked to talk about this topic and, and I uh, ask you all to be curious and explore this together me with me because I'm no expert. Uh, I'm giving this presentation because I'm really curious about AI and what it will mean for the design profession. So as Molly said, AI is not new, but there is a lot of new available tools out there. And I will share some examples on how we at Anthrop uh, has been using AI lately. And the focus today, from my point of view, is, is to talk about the opportunities, uh, not AI's impact on society or del delve into all the ethical issues. And I very much appreciated Molly's uh, take on that. Um, so you mentioned very shortly that Anthrop is a service and UX design agency, and we help organizations innovate and design services that generate user business and social value, always with people's needs and driving forces in focus. And this just leads over to the fact that we're convinced that the future is all about human-centered AI. And that's the, also the topic for today. When we use AI as a part of the design process, we always have the human needs in mind. So the central thing here is that we do not start from technology. It will continue to be about understanding what people need, what they will use and experience as valuable. So I will focus primarily on AI as a tool in the design process for human-centered designers um, to become more efficient, increase quality, et cetera. I will differentiate that also from AI as a solution to the challenges we as designers and innovators are trying to solve. So with that said, I'll start here. I'll take you through some, some examples. And the examples I'll, I'll share with you today are not perfect. We've tried them. You'll see how we use them and just take 
what you want as inspiration. Try them out yourself. Be critical and uh, and inspired. That's that's my goal. So uh, I'm not showing you any uh, perfect way of doing things. Okay. So at Antrop, we use the triple diamond to illustrate the design process. And I'll use this just to show how we used AI to explore and to innovate and to design and test. So you get a few tools and examples from each phase. So the tools we've used for research and analysis. Um, the first one here is uh, an example to do desktop research and, and business intelligence on Vajbevakni. So this example shows one of the services that uses an AI to extract and summarize results from scientific research. So we asked um, the question, how will AI affect the future of UX and service design? And here's a bunch of different answers taken from different scientific articles. And he says, eventually AI will be capable of performing even the intuitive and empathic tasks you see as it comes up. This, one, this tool has had some cr criticism, uh, but it's um, interesting to, to know about and, and maybe try out since it's um, scientific research that is the foundation here. Another way to explore, this is an example of a client whom we develop behavioral profiles through qualitative interviews in, in the proper <laughs> human way. Uh, but we had done tests to explore if AI can help us with new angles. And in this case, it was a, more about uh, sustainability. So we gave ChatGPT the most important parameters and the content beca um, became very similar to the one that we already had. So write a persona for an e-commerce food online. The persona should be conscious about. <laughs> and what we see here is that it gives us what we asked for, a name, it describes behavior, pain points, driving forces and needs. And we see that this can be a way of when you already have good data, uh, that, mean, that means we can sort of evaluate the result. This could be a way to, to work. So research in new ways. Uh, in this example, we have tested to let AI be the interviewer. So we gave ChatGPT the following prompt. We want, I want you to do research to understand how we can get Stockholm's residents to use public transport more. You should ask questions about needs and behaviors, et cetera, et cetera. And here, as you can see in this film here, the questions that the ChatGPT comes up with are not optimal. Um, there are all sorts of risks here, uh, of course, but it's more interesting than it, and it's helpful at this point. But still, it might be a way for us to complement the, the research that we do and, and try this further. So here, Chat GPT is the interviewer. Um, this is a, a maybe an obvious uh, uh, example that uh, many already knows about. So transcribing meetings. Uh, and this example is uh, is from a meeting yesterday when I have with two colleagues of mine uh, about this talk. And we invited fireflies.ai to the meeting as a note taker. So this can be used, for example, in, in user interviews. If you are not able to be two people, um, you can... Um, um, have someone else to take your notes. There's lots of uh, cons uh, with, with that because there's fewer people who actually hears the interview, but still it's it can be interesting. So what we see is that the service transcri transcribes the meeting, recognizes who says what, and provides a summary and statistics about the meeting. So that's just an example for you to take on. Uh, help and analysis is, of course, one of the, the strongest parts uh, of, of AI. And just mentioning one of one way we've tried this out this lately, um, the digital collaboration tool Miro recently lost, launched a Miro assistant that helps with analysis and also creates presentations for you. 
So that's something you can play around with if you haven't tried that already. You just select the post-its that you want analyzed and then you get, um, uh, yeah. It's You can also create presentation as you see here. Yes, and I've used AI primarily uh, in foresight and, and to create future scenarios. Uh, this is an example from my project at CEDA and the CEDA lab before ChatGPT was launched. So this is over a year ago. Um, in an all staff meeting with, I think, about 300 colleagues all over the world at the embassies, etc., um, we explored different future scenarios in the work towards a new vision and mission for CEDA. And uh, we invited our colleagues to a 90 minute time travel, first visiting three different versions of the future. Then everyone wrote individual letters from the future to themselves. Uh, all those letters were then analyzed by a text analysis tool or an AI tool called Decipher. And together with the Kairos Future, we had results within 30 minutes to share in the same meeting. And the, the results and the anal analysis of these future letters um, was shown. Uh, one way was like this. It's an overview and the AI has analyzed the similarities of all text and illustrated in from the letters in, in a heat map. We also had the AI, the, the AI distinguished the six main themes and they were in, illustrated uh, like this. I'm not going to go into depth, but it was an interesting live experiment where the AI could perform, perform something uh, in, in the meeting. So now let's see how we can use AI to innovate, to generate new ideas. Um, yes, I'll just run. Um, Yes, so AI generated future scenarios we've used to expand the perspectives and trigger ideas. And this was for a CEDA project aiming to support the green transition in the textile sector in Bangladesh. Uh, it's a very long project. I've been working with this project for one and a half year. Uh, but in February, I traveled to Dhaka and brought these uh, future scenarios with me. Uh, so we created two future scenarios with ChatGPT and MidJourney. And MidJourney is the image tool uh, that, that creates uh, images. And I used the scenarios as an icebreaker in a workshop with, with factory owners in Dhaka. Uh, the aim was sort of to broaden their view of possible futures and to get them to discuss something that was maybe uh, not their top of mind thinking. And you can see the prompts here as a, how I, I created this. But what what I presented to the in, in the workshop was this first scenario was about the prosperous future. And it was also the scenario that was given the most attention and serve as a inspiration for the participants. Um, scenario two is not as lovely. Uh, unfortunately, it is also the scenario that is most realistic for the country. But participants in this workshop represented those that was in the forefront of the green transition. And they could not identify with this scenario at all. But it uh, started interesting uh, discussions and it was really an, a good icebreaker. Um, yes, AI supported ideation based on behavioral profile. This is also to trigger new ideas. So we, in this example, we have started from a behavioral profile that was developed, developed in a project about improving driving driver training. And we gave ChatGPT the prompt, uh, give 10 creative ideas based, uh, based on, on this behavioral profile. So just pasting that into ChatGPT. And I think it looks a little bit like this. This was an, uh, is it sort of excellent as a trigger for new ideas. Most ideas were relevant, but it requires that you have the knowledge and the judgment to be able to assess the ideas yourselves. And it can also take quite a few rounds to uh, to ask follow-up questions and and 
get further into it. So that's an example how to get there. Yes. Enough about ideas. Lastly, a few tools for content creation, design, and testing. In the same project in, in Bangladesh, in the textile and RMG sector, we needed to create a quick prototype to test a quite complicated idea, a digital tool, um, in order to give users, uh, so in order to come up with this idea very quickly, uh, we asked ChatGPT for help to get relevant content and, and to sort of speed up the prototyping uh, work. Uh, so what I did was that I asked ChatGPT to list green practices or technologies uh, within energy efficiency, water efficiency, et cetera, that are relevant for the textile and RMG industry in Bangladesh in a table. So I asked it to, to structure it for me. I then asked for additional information about each technology, such as estimated investment cost, time horizon for return on investment. And I did not need to um, know the sources or quality check this, since it was just to convey the idea and try the, 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 the tool that we, the, the idea, the concept that we created. So I then copy pasted the table and I used that content that ChatGPT gave me, uh, copy pasted that into a prototyping, prototyping software called Figma. So we created this quick prototype of a, a digital tool to make the costs, uh, return on investment and benefits accessible. And in cards that were sort of, you could filter it like this. Uh, so you can filter on the water efficiency technologies. You can do it in the greenhouse gas emission cards. And then you can say, I want only those that are low and medium investment costs, et cetera. And then you can read more about each technology. So this prototype and the dialogue with ChatGPT was done in one day uh, with the help of one colleague of mine. So we did this in one day. We could... Uh, get this prototype out and test it straight away to see if this was something that was valuable. Okay, I think this is almost a few last ones here. Um, this is a tool that produces the sign from text and be it's not, it's a better version. Uh, it's a sort of can be a way to get started and get ideas on the sign. Um, Possibly a tool for, for maybe service designer who does not have the expertise to build digital design themselves. So if Galileo is not the perfect tool, there's also one that called Reloom uh, that could be interesting to check out and follow. That's also an integration with Figma for those of you who are interested in that. Oh, yeah, for testing solutions. Um, this is the last one. So synthetic user tests ideas and user flows uh, with simulated users. And the idea behind the product is that we must and need to test our services, and but it can be expensive and time uh, consuming. I'm spontaneously a bit torn about this um, and it is a better version, but I'm also curious. So I'll just keep it at that. <laughs> okay, very, very quickly, AI as a solution. I just wanted to mention how we at Anthrop also do something that we called an AI discovery, uh, where we help organizations to identify opportunities and competitive advantages with AI. So it's sort of a fast track to AI innovation. It's a three week design sprint. We take you from go your defined goals to concrete ideas for how you can optimize your processes and services with AI tools. And one quick example here, we did this with the team at Försäkringskassa. Um, after three joint sessions, we had a concept presentation based on the customer journey Kim Vabbar. So this is Care for Sick Children. Um, starting in the customer journey and then adding sort of an AI lane. So allows us to explore where in the customer journey or process AI could generate that value. So this is from the project and what we delivered was sort of 
uh, ideas generated, the, the idea, ideas that was generated in the process was visualized in an idea map like this. So each idea then was then conceptualized and detailed in, uh, described in detail. Uh, again, as well. Okay, I think my time is running out, so I'll be very, very quick. Uh, we use trigger cards to explore, to come up with the ideas. Um, I'll just go through, I think I skipped these because they're a bit, need to be explained a little bit more. So I think uh, since I know my time is up, I'll say thank you. <laughs> thank you, Maria. And thank you for all these uh, really great tools to use. Uh, and uh, since uh, the time is running out, I, I will invite Jonas Olsson, CEO at Speed, and Mats Widbom, CEO at Svensk Forum, and ask if you have some questions for Maria or maybe some reflections. Yes, uh, I, I can start. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, for very thought-provoking presentations. Uh, I guess I'm a representative of being uh, quite cu curious skepticism uh, for for AI, but but after these presentations, less skeptic and more optimistic. Uh, I, I think um, uh, one thing that you touch upon is uh, is the, the AI as a possibility of speeding up different processes that I think is interesting because um, and you were also talking about uh, human-centered design, but, but because we need to move also from human-centered design to a planet-centered design, and this, certainly time is very crucial in, in, in that shift. Uh, so my, my question is, could AI in, in your opinion, and I, I um, reach out to both of you, be a tool in, in this uh, huge uh, challenge to combat climate change and transform society in a sustainable direction in a short period of time, because time is really in, in the forefront of, of being able to, to transform in, in society. Um, so I think it, especially what you show in just in what in 24 hours, how much you can do. So, so that, that was really something that I would like to hear, um, and I, uh, your thoughts about, uh, then another reflection on, on time is when, uh, I wrote an, a chronicle in, in, uh, our magazine form the last summer about AI friend or foe. And at that time, uh, for me, it was clearly more uh, the feeling of foe within the design community, but it, just in, a, in let's say three, four months, it's more towards friend and uh, everyone is looking into how can we use AI. Uh, so it has also been go moving, very, I don't know if you agree with me, but it has been going really fast, uh, even if we had um, last uh, summer, uh, summer, Sommarpratare, <laughs> Max Tegmark, who really put, uh, you know, um, our fears in, in the in front of AI taking over and, and uh, taking over humanity. Um, so I think we, we need to navigate uh, between uh, dystopian and utopian futures and, and see really where this can be a tool. And so uh, my hopes is that this can be a tool to speed up uh, things that needs to be happening very fast. Maria, do you want to answer mm. that? Yeah, I could. Uh, in terms of the, the first question you asked, uh, if we can speed up the, 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 the battle against climate change, I think absolutely. I, because of AI, as you, as you saw in this prototyping example, it, it, sp it absolutely sped up that process. But I would also say we're working quite a lot with system mapping, uh, understanding the system and how everything is integrated. And I'd say during the last four or five years, all my projects has been more and more and more complex. 
and they're just growing and growing and growing. And we're working with this zooming out to see the big picture and then zooming in on details and testing what you, behaviors that we can change. And I always struggle with the big picture. How can we make that? Because it takes time to make a system mapping. But with AI, that helps a lot. Uh, we can get that help as long as we are all, always critical and that we test with real humans. <laughs> Can I add a couple of yeah, things of course. that mm. I yes, think are probably. bigger picture? Um, one thing that we haven't talked about here is the um, the planetary cost of AI when mm. it comes to computation. Um, a lot of us heard about that with blockchain, for instance, the sheer amount of computational power that was required and the way that that taxes the environment. Now, it's interesting, you know, Helena is in Luleo, which is a, a place with data centers because the climate affords it. But I think that there are questions about the computational cost. And in the United States, as the US government looks at this question of, of, of the AI explosion, there is a question about what it will do for the environment. So there is a sustainability question about how the computation is produced. And the other thing that we haven't talked about at all here is where the data comes from that these different models are trained on. Um, they, it comes from somewhere. Um, it originally comes from people, data comes from the past and data has biases. So without questions from people like us, especially qualitative designers and service designers, we need to, we need to question what we are training things on. Mm -hmm. There are popular examples of AI hallucinating and platforms hallucinating. I'm not even talking about that, but let's say we're working on a policing system. How do we know that the, the data there is, is going to be fair, that it isn't based or um, going to harm people um, with what's there? So a lot of the, the kind of government level conversation about AI and academic conversation about AI is about bias correction. So these are, these are a couple of important things. I will tell you that I stay optimistic about technology because otherwise I wouldn't be able to study it. But um, but I think these are really important roles for us as people who are close to people and who design those interfaces. Thank I you, Molly. I'm... And uh, Jonas uh, yes. Olsson, CEO at Svid. Yes, uh, I'm CEO at Svid, Swedish Industrial Design Foundation. We are quite keen on using design and AI in the in our projects, but uh, mostly because of our uh, head of communication, Caroline is um, doing this fantastic work with inspiring seminars, uh, lectures for the staff uh, internally at Svit uh, on on AI. But I was thinking about AI as the new new to get back to you, Molly, when you did the uh, your first picture there about AI is the new. And I think it is the new new. And uh, when it comes back to your last picture about improving the world, I do believe that it's something we must use it to improve the world. And when it comes down to sustainability issues, uh, where we can use AI generated future scenarios and the speculative design uh, topics, um, I think it has a, it, it has a, a really good point there. But it all comes back to ethics, morality, and principles, and also to have an extremely critical eye on what you see and what you hear and what you read uh, all the time. I think it, it makes me think that so much of design and art is about finding generative structures, right? Yeah. I, I, I look back to Dadaism continually as, as for me, one of the most important generative structures in the 20th century, just ways of looking completely different at something that you couldn't get to on your own. Um, but I, I think that with the technological aspect, you really do need to have the critical angle and use it to ask different questions that you wouldn't have asked, not just accept the answers. Uh, I, I, I agree totally, but I was thinking of uh, one thing in contradiction to what you said, Mats, actually, it was also, could we use AI to slow things down a little bit, please? Because I think we need to take uh, more of a, um, a firm grip together on understanding this complexity in which you all swim in together, this big uh, pool of uh, complexity, and in order to understand things more. Uh, and not put the understanding into a data generated um, um, data generated uh, computer that doing the solving for us 
things for us and uh, just in order to to speed up things yes. but i do i did uh, a small uh, very unacademic work this morning when i asked my uh, chat gpt friend uh, tell me the benefits of working with ai as a designer and she answered quite well on that one actually uh, about generative design and and how to enhance creativity but also to improve accessibility and that AI can assist designing products and interfaces that are more accessible to users with different abilities. But I also took the took the time to ask her, tell me the challenges working with AI, the challenges working with AI as a designer. And it also come back to the idea about understanding and integrating AI technology, how we must be aware, how we must be critical, and also uh, know what kind of technology technology we are using, on what time we're using it, and why we are using it. Uh, do you want to answer that, Maria? Yeah, just very quickly, uh, I'd say in all of the examples where we tried AI tools right now, we've all done the real work beforehand. So we have good data anyway. And I think that within a couple of years, lots of people will try to do behavioral profiles and make decisions based on AI only uh, answers, and that's risky. And right. that maybe is also very important then that we as designers sort of dif differentiate ourselves and makes the real work and are critical and make sure that we're not biased. So that's a super important counter reaction sort of when this becomes more mainstream. But at this point now, I think we also need to explore how it can help our work. We are so. prototyping a machine for uh, that's going to improve the world a little bit, but uh, we're testing it together in uh, real time, in full time. Yes, uh, we like have it. some questions from uh, from uh, the audience. Uh, Caroline you, uh, Jonas, you mentioned our uh, communication manager at Svid. Caroline, do you want to ask some question here from the audience? Yes, we have uh, we have some questions. Uh, Joan Greenberg says um, directed to Maria. If we're using generative AI trained on biased set of data in our design process, how can we be aware or reduce the risk of having a restricted and limited result? Uh, and he would like to hear your take on, on that. Um, yeah, I don't have an answer for that properly. I just, uh, we, we we cannot only rely on the, the generative AI answers. We need to combine it and test it. And But we can get hypothesis and we can evaluate that with real users um, so that it needs to be a mix um, every time. Thank yeah, you, Maria. And, and we have one last question, uh, Caroline, from the yes, audience. Yes, uh, Jorgen, he, he says or asks that an open question uh, regarding AI that uh, I'm curious about is how it might affect the human creative behaviors. By that, he means uh, like the way photography affected the way the art world of painting into the creative impressionism, expressionism and so on, because that was something that a, a photo couldn't capture. What is the... Um, what is it that AI can't do? Well, one, of, mm. one of the things I think that we we see is AI is so AI is about patterns, right? Find data, learn patterns that we might not create ourselves. And that's what's so uncanny when we see mid-journey or other kinds of images, when when we look at architecture or through through a lens of um, generative tools, we see things we might not have imagined on our own because it finds different ways through the patterns. So I think that that's something that's really promising. But again, there's a question of where those patterns came from. Um, tools like Midjourney and Dolly were trained on the data of many, many artists and designers who didn't cons didn't give consent to have their work um, combed and and sampled. So that gets to be a question. It's on the labor of how many million people, and I think that begs a different kind of question too. Thank you, Molly. And time is running out and Mats is holding his hand up. So Mats, last word. Please. Yeah, so um, going back to this last question, uh, um, I could recommend the reading of uh, the American philosopher Hubert Dreyfus that already in the 1960s wrote the book, uh, What Computers Can't Do, and then later on also What Computers Still Can't Do. And I think 
um, <laughs> what what uh, uh, would be an interesting way to define also uh, what is um, uh, the um, most valuable thing of being a human and not a machine uh, that AI can help us to to clarify that and um, where human imagination, fantasy, and creativity. Uh, indeed, our entire thinking process are intimately interconnected with our emotions, bodies, hands, and senses. And this is certainly something that, uh, at least at this moment, uh, computers can't do. So I think there will be very interesting dynamics be between man and machine uh, uh, in, the f in the future development of our AI. Thank you so much. Uh, I can see Jonas, is, you wanted to say something. Finally, uh, an applaud applauding. to yeah to everybody. <laughs> Thank you so no, much, Molly, to Matt, Bright, the Lincoln, words, and yeah. Maria, mm. uh, Mats, Jonas, Caroline, and Sofia, and of course mm. everybody who attended this design talk. And we recorded everything, and we will publish it on Sweet's YouTube channel and Svensk Forms Vimeo channel. And please come back and uh, join us the sixth of December. Then we have focus on design and the climate. So big thank you, everybody, and uh, have a great uh, ski day on Friday, Maria, and a great <laughs> trip home to Minneapolis, Molly. Nika. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks. <laughs>